to everyone uh, to the Public Speakers Bureau of the Douglas County Master Gardeners. Uh, and we are uh, very privileged to have with us Kevin Nelson, who happens to be our Douglas County Master Gardener President. Um, and he has been very active with uh, the Monarch Way Stations, particularly the one uh, you see the photo behind him, the Monarch Watch, uh, which is on the KU campus, the West Campus behind Foley Hall. Um, and I'm sure he'll be uh, discussing that as well. So um, I'm gonna ask folks, uh, if you have any comments or questions, uh, please add them to the chat room. And after uh, Kevin's presentation, then uh, he will answer your questions and uh, we'll have a good conversation about uh, Monarch. So take it away, Kevin. Thank you, John, and, and thanks for all the people who are live participating in this lecture, as well as the people who might be viewing it in a recorded fashion on YouTube. We're trying to capture as much information as we can uh, available for people to consume as is convenient for them, and that's the, the point of this presentation. I'm, I'm here to talk about things that we don't typically hear about from the, the Monarch Watch organization. Uh, specifically about way stations. They do an awful lot of information around the tagging of monarchs and tracking them, uh, their breeding, the uh, other information that they're collecting. But this specifically is about our role as master gardeners as it relates to the way station. And you may have seen these signs uh, in your neighborhood. Uh, there are a number of them here in, in uh, Lawrence. Uh, but I wanted to begin by talking about uh, the, the point of it and where it all began. Uh, Chip Taylor founded Monarch Watch back in 1992 when uh, he was looking at the research that was done uh, by a Canadian zoologist in tracking the migration of the monarch butterfly from the mountains of Mexico up into Canada. Uh, it was fascinating research. Uh, he thought enough of it to assume the, the role of running the, the tagging and tracking program for the Eastern monarchs. There's two populations of monarchs, the Western population west of the Rockies, and then the Eastern population that, that we're most uh, familiar with here in Kansas and, and throughout the Midwest. Uh, as I said, he followed on the, the footsteps and the work of this Canadian zoologist who started tagging back in 1940. So this has been going on for a long time and it has really elucidated what a dramatic journey the monarch population takes from their overwintering sites way down in central Mexico into the southern United States throughout the Midwestern Corn Belt and up into the southern parts of Canada. It's a, a travel of over 2,000 miles and it's typically done in stages where the, the monarchs will be stopping at particular sites laying eggs and it's the next generation that will then proceed further north. Um, and that happens throughout the spring and summer. And then in the fall, the population that is heading south again, doesn't do any breeding. They're just about traveling. And um, all of them need to have places where they can um, rest. And in the spring and, and summer, to mate and to produce new butterflies and always places to, to feed. As you can see, the Western population has a much shorter migration, but the same kind of North and South uh, transition that they go through that um, really helps understand what we can do to understand them and to track them effectively. This is a slide, and, and many of my slides, I, I have to acknowledge right up front, are, are garnered from Monarch Watch. Uh, they do all the research. They do a lot of the uh, collection and presentation of the data. And we track and, and understand the population density by looking at the uh, a number of hectares that they overwinter in in Mexico. Obviously, they can't count all these butterflies, but you can count um, how dense the wintering sites are. And that's what this bar graph represents. And there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. You know, clearly this was among the, the most significant uh, populations uh, back in 1996-97, that, that winter time frame. And I wanna mark that because as we talk about some of the other things going on environmentally, 
Um, that is an important year. Another really important year is here in 2004, 2005. And to better understand that, and I, I do want to take a moment to talk about the, the decline here. As you can see, it's a steadily re declining graph. And uh, while there have been occasional ups and downs, for the most part, the population is continuing to dwindle in the Eastern monarch population. Um, the question of why comes into better understanding the, the habitat and what they have been used to. Um, this is the native tall grass prairie as it existed before man came and turned its soil under and used it for uh, agriculture. Um, when you use it for agriculture, particularly the monoculture that we have now, um, you lose a lot of diversity of plants. Likewise, as you uh, convert soil that used to be tall grass prairie to agriculture, you um, reduce the, the number of plants and, and pollinator plants that are available for the, the population to feed off of. Um, it is not all agriculture. We're losing 6,000 acres a day in the U.S. to development, uh, turning fields into parking lots or housing developments or bu buildings. Um, that significantly impacts the monarchs, um, as well as more intensive, once again, uh, monoculture agriculture, where um, if you think about it, the, the population of a butterfly, if, if I'm flying through a field of soybeans, if those soybeans are not flowering, I have nothing to eat. Uh, and that's an important consideration as we think about, you know, when you look over these fields of, of soybeans and corn and uh, cotton, you see um, a real lack of diversity and, and any kind of food for a pollinator butterfly or other insect. Um, what isn't mentioned as much is the impact of the herbicide Roundup. Uh, I'm telling a little story here. Um, when I was in college, I worked at a country club uh, in their uh, landscape maintenance department as one of the assistant superintendents. And I, I'll never forget the first year I was there, the old he, uh, he was not a greenskeeper because he informed me that, no, he was a superintendent, uh, called me into his office and he unlocked the herbicide cabinet and took out this little quart bottle of this new herbicide and took out a spray bottle and uh, a couple of tablespoons of this uh, product into the spray bottle and handed it to me and said, this kills everything and it kills it to the root. I want you to go and spray it around the fences and the trees and don't waste it because it's really expensive. That was my first exposure to Roundup. It was really expensive, but it was also really effective. Uh, Roundup is, was a real revolution in herbicides because it was non-selective. If you sprayed it with Roundup, it died, no matter what it was. And it was a great product for, because of that, because there were a number of weeds that were very troublesome that uh, we wanted to control. And Roundup introduced a product that was very effective. It was relatively low toxicity compared to other things that were available, things like Paraquat, Agent Orange, you may have heard from the, the Vietnam War. Um, it degrades pretty rapidly and it doesn't seem to have too much of an effect on aquatic animals. So it was a real revolution. Uh, back in the 70s when it was introduced, you would apply it with sprays as, as I did at the country club, but they also used it as wicking. Uh, and that was one of the interesting things uh, I noted when um, I was in college that I would see the commercials for Roundup on TV and they would show these tractors with these big, long PVC booms that had uh, nylon wicks dragging from them. And all you had to do was fill that boom up with, with Roundup. And as it went over the field, it would rub against the plant and any of the plant's green material that got touched with Roundup would die. And that was their real uh, marketing ploy, which was Roundup kills it and it kills it to the roots. It's not like other herbicides that might just stunt a plant 
Roundup, when it's taken in by the plant, kills it to the root. And that's great for the weeds. The problem is when the weeds are the source of the food for so many insects. And what happened in 1996, as Monsanto saw the patent expiry of Roundup coming, they put together their genetic engineers and they developed crops that were now Roundup tolerant. These fields could be sprayed with Roundup. There's no wicking. It, the whole field could be sprayed and it would then kill everything but the crop that was genetically modified to be tolerant to Roundup. And as you can see on this graph from the USDA, uh, it started in 1996 and as of 2020, almost 95% of corn, soybeans, cotton, uh, alfalfa, they, they have come up with a Roundup ready everything. And you can spray those entire fields with Roundup and the only thing that survives is the crop. What a great thing for agriculture. What a horrendous thing for pollinating insects. That was a real significant impact. And as you'll remember, the graph that we saw, um, the, the population began significantly declining in 1997 as they started implementing these broad applications of gallons and gallons, no longer tablespoons of Roundup. This is the Roundup usage in 1992. And hopefully you can all see this. Um, broadly used, but sparingly used. You can see less than uh, four pounds per acre or square mile in a lot of the United States. And I was talking with Jean as before this meeting began. If you look at this map, you can see basically where is agriculture in the United States. And every place that you see the tan or the brown, you see Roundup used, and that's agriculture. Very intensive in the California Valley because of uh, the intensive agriculture that's going on there greater than 88 pounds of the product put on every square mile. This is 92, 93. Roundup ready crops have been in development and then they hit 96. First year, 97. You see the map starting to get browner and browner. That is Roundup ready crops taking over, 99. 2000, 2001, it just keeps growing. Every place that's dark brown has been virtually wiped clean of anything other than a crop. And that is an important impact on the monarch population. When we look at the map now, this is 2015. All the dark brown is greater than 88 pounds of Roundup per square mile. If you're a monarch butterfly flying south from Mexico, a great deal of the uh, milkweed and other pollinator plants that you've come to depend on are gone. As we look back and remember that migration pattern, look at the pattern or the normal migration of the monarch and the distribution of Roundup usage. You can see how significant that development was for the monarch population. Back to our friend, Dr. Taylor. Why are we being so slow? 
You'll recall that here was the development of Roundup Ready crops. Uh, there were some significant uh, growth years. We got to remember that it's not just about the the destruction of the the pollinator plants, but it's also about the climate. And the years in the late 90s and early 2000s were very good climatically. Um, we had not seen some of the global climate change that we had. Um, there weren't as many concerns about freezing in the Mexican mountains, but there was this significant decline. And once again, this one was a real eye opener. Uh, this was a the, the lowest population or that they had mapped in the Mexico mountains uh, since the program began and it raised alarms with Dr. Taylor. Um, and we saw the same thing happening in the Western population. Um, I did want to use this screen to show just how perilous the Western population is. Uh, once again, its uh, population is impacted by the use of Roundup in the Central Valley. You saw that brown streak in the middle of California way back uh, years ago. Um, that has not gone away. They continue to use uh, Roundup fairly extensively, um, but that problem is now exacerbated by the climate change that we are seeing uh, throughout the, the globe, but specifically in California and the Western states. Um, the horrendous wildfires are, you know, if you are a, a monarch, you could count on at least having something on the side of the hill where they couldn't farm. Um, those hillsides are now black because of the wildfires. Likewise, the warming environment has made summer or, or winters really pleasant for the humans, but it has meant that a monarch population can't hibernate because it's just too warm. Um, the numbers in the Western population are down 99.9% .9 from where they were in the 80s. Uh, this last year, with 250 sites counting, uh, the, one of the highest numbers of, of citizen scientists they've had, they counted less than 2,000 total monarchs at all of those sites. Um, I talked with Dr. Taylor earlier this year, and he's, he's not optimistic about the, the future of the monarch population in the Western states. And it's a real tragedy uh, that is... Uh, very much influenced by man, if not caused. <clears throat> so as I had said, Dr. Taylor was also alarmed in 2004. And, and he decided that, you know, we're, we're responsible for a lot of this, but we can also be a, a positive in all of this. He saw the decline. Uh, he was alerted to the fact that in 2000, Roundup went off patent. So it's now really inexpensive compared to what it was when I was first handed a couple tablespoons in 1979. Um, that distribution of Roundup has significantly impacted the amount of milkweed. Dr. Taylor saw that and he said, you know, they need kind of what they had with the Pony Express riders, you know, places where they could go a certain amount of distance and know that there would be milkweed, there would be water, there would be pollinator plants, uh, nectar plants, where they could stay away from the development and there would be a place for them to carry on. Much like the Pony Express, they, a way station. The tagging process was all about citizen scientists and the way station concept was to enlist those citizen scientists again to help or facilitate their understanding of the problem and help them develop these way stations. And the first way station was established behind Monarch Watch on the West Campus of KU back in 2005. It was put in by the Douglas County Master Gardeners and uh, was Monarch way station number one. Chips was number two. Um, Marguerite's, Marguerite was one of the Master Gardeners responsible for putting it in. Hers was number five. Uh, mine in 2009 was number 15,155, 2019, I'm sorry. So 
Two years ago, mine was 15,000. There are now over 36,000 Monarch Way stations, which I consider a very positive sign of the engagement of the larger population in understanding man's role in impacting the environment and doing at least small efforts to try to change it. Um, the Master Gardeners presented it to the International Master Gardener Society and it was recognized as a, an excellence award winner. Um, if you have not seen the Monarch Way Station number one on the West Campus of the University of Kansas, it is worth going to. A really impressive small space with a tremendous plant and wildlife diversity that is inspirational. As you can see, Way Stations internationally, uh, over 36,000 of them now. And it's an opportunity for everyone to get involved and to better understand and quite honestly, to start to hopefully make a change back towards a more sustainable environment for the monarchs and, and the other pollinator insects. Um, despite all the spots on that uh, map, you have to keep in mind that we're talking a couple hundred square feet for the most part. So we would need a lot more of these spots in order to really help the, the population uh, maintain and hopefully in, in the future rebound. So that's the next part of this. That's why we come up with this way station. So the question becomes, how do I create one? Um, it's not hard at all. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna show you how you can do hundred square feet in less than two minutes <laughs> through the, uh, the wonders of time-lapse photography. But you do need a, a sunny location uh, and, and I am, all for converting turf grass. Turf grass is the number one crop in the United States of America. I'm not saying a cash crop, it's just a crop. It's something that humans tend with not a whole lot of output. Um, I've never seen anyone, well, with the exception of the sod farmers, no one makes any money off of their turf grass. Um, as a rule, the the inputs are significant to keep that in, um, in what was the irrigation and um, fertilization in all the inputs necessary to keep that grass looking green. Um, so I have been systematically converting more and more of my turf grass to things other than turf grass. Uh, and I, I think everyone should. I, and I have another discussion where I, I talk through, if you think about people, while you see on the commercials, they talk about lawn envy and people walking by and, oh man, that's a beautiful lawn. I'm more likely to run across someone and say, wow, that's an amazing flower bed. Uh, or that's, you know, it's a really striking rock garden. And I would urge you all to think about taking some of that turf grass that you may already have and converting it to something that's much more sustainable and much more valuable for the monarchs and the other pollinator insects. But in order to do that, you need to remove the existing green material. Uh, we have found in the master gardeners here in Douglas County that uh, covering with cardboard and then putting compost uh, or topsoil on top of that compost and then mulching it is enough to really suppress any of the weeds that are there already and set the soil uh, very effectively to receive your new starts when you are ready to do so. So I had promised doing a way station bed in two minutes and that's what this is gonna be about. Uh, I did this actually yesterday. I had a couple pieces of cardboard that um, I got from the neighbor. And I have found the most effective way, rather than trying to dig up the soil, is to just remove the green material, using a weed eater to take it down to the dirt. Uh, once that is done, uh, this, the city of Lawrence has really some amazing compost that uh, acts as a water uh, container and as a uh, future fertilizer for the, pro the plants that you put in 
Uh, I then mulch it and let it sit. Um, this is the other half of my 100 square feet. As you can see, it goes really fast, well, particularly when time lapse. I did this literally in, in less than an hour. Um, and I got rid of a lot of turf grass that was really challenging to mow. Um, what I will be doing with this bed is taking some of the plants that have been um, replicating and uh, moving them out of the bed that's behind me right there and moving it further up the side of this hill to expand the pollinator bed that I have you know, behind my home. Um, as I said, by treating it this way with the compost and then the mulch on top of it, we don't see a lot of weeds come through. And if you wait on it, if you did this now in, or in September and then just let it sit all winter long, what you would find is that when you come out in the spring or even in uh, October, if you wanted to, um, the grass underneath would be dead, the earthworms would be doing their business and the soil would be undisturbed. And I, I really prefer this method to the, the toil of digging stuff up, not only because it's easier, but because I'm less likely to disrupt the, the soil or, or architecture below the surface. Uh, we're learning more and more about the importance of the, uh, the fungal environment and the bacterial environment in the soil and how uh, tilling it up disrupts that. So this method allows you to keep that soil intact while still suppressing the weeds. Um, as I had indicated, we did that at uh, Monarch Watch earlier this year, uh, waited for, I wanna say uh, six weeks and then plugged through the cardboard underneath all of these plants that you see. And as you can see, the, the weeds are not filling in the difference um, the compost on top was enough to keep that suppressed. And what's coming up here, and you've yet to really see it, are all the native plants that we put into that uh, cardboard. And this is going to be the, the prairie portion of the Monarch Way Station number one. So this is the way I recommend everyone converting turf grass to something else. If you don't have rings around your trees where you've got compost underneath or, or mulch underneath, keep in mind that turf grass is competing with your trees for water and nutrients. If you just weed eat the turf down to the dirt and throw some mulch on top of it, it will suppress all of that grass and you won't have to mow it anymore and the tree will be much happier for the intervention you've just had. So now that we've got this bed in place, we've been waiting, why do we plant? First and foremost, plant what you love. And this is my advice to anyone who comes up to me and asks me, what do I, what do I plant? Plant what you love, because if you don't love it, it's just a weed and you're not going to take care of it. Um, for a monarch way station, you need to have at least two species of milkweed that you love as well as a diversity and, and a plethora of nectar plants, far more nectar plants than you have milkweed. Um, and ideally perennials and, and natives because the perennials in, in the, uh, the geography where you are living, whether you be here in Kansas or, or somewhere else watching this, those are the plants that are gonna be most likely to survive year after year without a lot of maintenance. They were able to do so before we ever hit the this uh, continent, they're going to be able to do it without our intervention moving forward. If you plant a lot of really exotic, uh, high maintenance things, you can count on either spending a lot of time taking care of them or watching them die year after year. <clears throat> the other thing is to think about is, is when are they going to be blooming? As I said, the monarchs are, are going north in the spring and summer and coming back south in the fall. If there are things not in bloom to provide nectar, they're not going to uh, be as interested in your place. Um, <clears throat> there will be some periodic maintenance. Initially, you'll wanna make sure that it gets enough moisture. You wanna think about what is the, the nature of my soil there, 
not put in a plant like a, a swamp milkweed that's looking for more moisture in a place the side of the hill like I've got where there's not a lot of moisture. Um, the other thing that you want to make sure is you want to be comfortable getting having them eaten um, because the while there are things like Japanese beetles eating them, there's also a lot of caterpillars. And if you don't have caterpillars, you don't have butterflies. And that's one of the challenges a lot of people face is they watch the plants be consumed and it really bothers them. You just got to be able to, to power through those emotions and let the caterpillars have their way because that's how they're going to turn into butterflies. Um, <clears throat> I could provide a whole bunch of lists of plants, but I don't because I don't know what you love. Uh, I will provide some, some resources where you can find it, but keep this in mind. As I said, you're looking for milkweed uh, with the soil type in mind, and you're looking for flowers that will be blooming at different places and time to support them with nectar. The, the food is going to be much more commonly needed than the place for the, the caterpillars. So importantly, put in a lot of flowers. And as I said, I don't run across too many people who love my grass, but they do love my wildflowers. And that's what I would urge you all to do is fill it with wildflowers. It becomes very low maintenance and it's supportive of the butterfly population. As I had indicated, I could give you a whole list, but I would urge you go visit some of the, the plots that master gardeners tend in your county. Go look at the plants that are there. Most of the master gardeners are doing a good job of keeping track of the names. Here in Douglas County, we're focusing more and more on the natives so that when you go visit our plots, you're going to see demonstrations of native plants more so than exotic plants. Um, and there's still a tremendous amount of diversity, but those are things we know that we don't have to tend as much and ultimately is going to be uh, better for the, the population of the insects because the insects get used to a particular species as well. And they're wanting the natives when they are in a particular environment. They're not looking for something that's in the mountains of Japan or uh, Nepal as beautiful as those plants might be, the insects don't necessarily know what to do with them. And many of the butterflies have specific species of plant that they need to lay their eggs on. The monarchs are a great example where they're looking for milkweed, but there's other plants. If you want to see a zebra swallowtail, you need to have a pawpaw tree. And um, that's something we got to keep in mind is that we're trying to support the overall environment. And here are a couple of, of resources. I would urge you all, as you are looking for plants, you look to websites that end in .org, not .com. The .org are nonprofits and they need your support and they're not as inclined to do things just for the money. They're doing things because it's the right thing to do. Uh, Monarch Watch is one of those, the Xerxes Society, the Pollinator Partnership. Um, there's a number of different and, and growing places where you can get uh, native plants that are not only supportive of the various insects that we want to populate, but uh, nectar to support them. And that's all that I have to hopefully generate questions from you all that will extend this closer to the hour that we have allotted. John, do we have? Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. I don't see any uh, questions in the chat room. Um, uh, our uh, participants are welcome to unmute. You can unmute yourself if you like and uh, ask a question directly. Um, and maybe while you're thinking of questions or comments that you'd like to add, um, I'll uh, ask Kevin a question. Um, Okay, so unfortunately, I have a lot of shade. I've been one. I would love to do a Monarch Way Station. What's the minimum amount of sunlight that you need for a way station? I, I think it's not so much the amount of sunlight as the pl uh, place where you can get a milkweed to successfully grow. 
So if you can get a couple milkweed plants on the perimeter of your yard and you have all the pollinator plants under your shade, I, I, mean, you know, I know you have hostas, you know, great nectar plant and, and butterflies are always on my, my hostas enjoying a, a nice meal. So as long as there is a space where you can have milkweed, you're effectively a monarch way station. The, okay. the key is to have that diversity and, and you only need a couple of, of milkweeds. My milkweed, believe it or not, is, is now growing up through one of my willows trees that it just kind of showed up there. And it's now eight feet tall because it's got the, the willow supporting it. And uh, it's, it's a, a common milkweed that's eight feet tall. And I've seen a number of caterpillars and, and indication of caterpillars, um, but that's enough to support them. And then I've got all these other pollinator plants that are there for the food. So if you've got one or two milkweeds that can survive, you're good to go. But so, so you have to have more than, the, I have the butterfly weed that grows for me, but I'm afraid to put in the common milkweed because I'm afraid of, of too many seedlings. Is that a, a problem or not? Should I not worry about that? Uh, only in terms of, it's the same way we found with, with growing vegetables, that if you don't give this plants enough space of their own to grow, they, they get overcrowded. Right. So, so that's all I would do. You know, let your, your butterfly milkweed come up. Uh, that's all that the, the butterflies are going to need to lay eggs on. And then when the eggs uh, hatch and the caterpillars consume it, you, you've done your job. And, and you with your, your hostas are providing a, a real um, dining room experience for the, well, the pollinators. Nectar, yeah, but I'm not sure about, you know, but host for, for caterpillars per se, but. Okay, yeah. so I've got to, I got to kick in here. It's Terry Wilkie's. Um, there was a very good K-State training K deal. And a young woman was at the Hutchinson spa uh, station and she was talking about gardening with native plants. And she described that she was ruthless with her common milkweed. So they don't, they spread by seed, yes, but they spread by an underground rhizome. Oh, there you can see. And so what I have learned is pick your bed or your place, your 10 by 10 foot space would be perfect, Kevin. And then just don't let it get outside it. And I'm gonna tell you what, they send up suckers really fast. Mm. And so, well, no, uh, Jean, just go I'm pull sorry. it. They, yeah. they snap easy. Yeah. I mean, the they don't have hers, you know? Yeah, and, I don't know. Uh, and like really be ruthless with those plants. Sure. Okay, so Kevin, you see in the chat, I asked, yep. I leave these things and they get kind of leggy. They start to lean over and stuff and stuff. And I'm afraid to, to continue to be ruthless uh, with them because I'm afraid of damaging eggs. So is there a cycle for the monarchs in Lawrence, Kansas? Can you explain that? Uh, there is a cycle. And uh, in, in talking with, with Dr. Taylor, anything past mid or August, they're not really gonna make it. Uh, that's not the population that's ultimately getting down to Mexico. And, and by the time they go through their life cycle, they're, um, their problem, they're probably not going to be able to, to make it down to Mexico. And, and the population that starts heading back south and, and that we see come through the, the second week of September is the population is just traveling. Um, they're not focused on, on populating at that point. So if, if it's getting leggy now, um, to your point, you can snap it off. The, uh, the, it will continue to, to be there for the 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 few caterpillars that want, to, or the few butterflies that want to lay eggs. But I would say past uh, the end of August, you're not seeing a population that's laying eggs. And, and if they do lay eggs, they're not going to develop according to Dr. Taylor. So what you're telling us is our job now is to have flowers blooming that the butterflies can have the nectar. Yeah. Yes. That. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. And, and to, to Terry's point, you know, that's, that was the, the great thing about Roundup, was Roundup killed it to the roots. And you could, you could spray one part of the plant and everything underground would die. And it's great for agriculture, it's really crappy for monarchs. Terry, you also asked, uh, what do the monarch uh, butterfly tags look like and uh, should we report if we find a tag monarch? How does that work? 
Uh, the tag is about the size of a pencil eraser. And if, um, if you find one and, and can actually read it without, understand that it, capturing the monarch uh, runs the risk of ending its journey. Because uh, you, while you, you can carefully monitor them, you can also damage their wings to the point where they, they're not able to continue. So um, if I see a tag when I go, hey, great. And I let it. I let it be, because um, because I don't want to be the one to to in my effort to try to capture it to to tag a market to to uh, kill it. In other words, what you're telling us is we can look at dead monarchs for tags. Yes, yes, definitely and, and dead monarchs. What do we do if we find a dead monarch that's got a tag? What? what? Go to the Monarch Watch website. There's places where. Uh, there's a number of different links, and, and I was going to show one of the links that um, I should have done it earlier. So rather than, than um, show you all, all of the, the different plants and talk about them, Monarch Watch has got them all in here, and, and they're all categorized by perennial, annual, tracks the bees, tracks butterflies. Um, but hummingbirds, all of those things are in these check marks. Once again, this is a great place to investigate the things that you love. But I can't stress enough, put in things that you love and then see whether or not it's going to do well for you. Um, and if it does, great. You're, you're right where you want to be. But a lot of times we look at things we love and go, to, to Jean's point, I love some of these plants that love sun. <laughs> Well, not in your yard. So uh, this is a great way to uh, to go to the Monarch Watch website, and there are plants for butterfly and pollinator gardens. This is their their page. Rather than try to cover them all, I would just soon provide resources that you can go investigate. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else have uh, questions or comments they'd like to uh, voice? Yeah. <clears throat> the the other thing I would uh, as I'm we're looking at this particular screen, you'll see that a number of these different um, plants are the host for particular butterflies. If there's a butterfly that you love, mm -hmm. you want to provide the plant that it uh, is going to act as a host. Right. Um, so I, I might add. Um, uh, I'm a member of the Friends of Oak Hill Cemetery, and Kelly Kinsher um, is kind of aching to turn gobs of turf into a prairie um, uh, out there. And obviously, it would need it, it would be in the full sun um, areas, right? Um, mm -hmm. And he probably already knows how to go about doing that. But but what would be your recommendation um, in terms of turning cemetery turf? into a new prairie, or I could say an old prairie, really. <laughs> yeah, it, um, the, the, I, I've seen a number of lectures on, on converting prairie remnants back into prairie, and um, they typically do it with um, breaking up the soil. Uh, as I said, I've, I've come very sensitive to trying not to disturb the soil if I can. I just there's so much evidence now, the importance of the, the mycorrhiza under the ground that if we can avoid that, we, we should. Um, you know, the, depending upon the size, as I said, I, I did that 100 square feet in less than an hour, and that was changing the, the weed eater uh, cord. Um, you can quickly take all that grass to the roots and then just put some mulch on top of it and the vast majority of the grass will not make it back through that mulch. You put cardboard on top of it, none of it's coming back through the mulch. Mm -hmm. And then you just uh, introduce whatever you want as your, your native prairie plant. Um, the majority of the prairies are filled with various grasses rather than forbs. Um, so it would be a mixture of those. Uh, I know Sharon and the uh, extension group just put out a couple of of pamphlets on um, returning prairie to the, or 
uh, agricultural land to prairie, uh, restoring prairie remnants, and it walks through all of those those steps and, and recommended plants. But once again, it, it kind of depends upon what you love. I would think in a cemetery, I would want more forbs than I would got grass. Yeah. Just because, you know, you, you want people to visit the cemetery to come look at the flowers and remember their loved ones. Yeah. Um, and Andrea just mentioned uh, Sharon's uh, list as well. So thanks, Andrea, for that. That's very helpful. Yeah. Because obviously with a cemetery. Wait, okay, let me, let me say again, uh, Janae. So I am sitting on a citizen committee of the sustainability advisory board that is re-looking at the city code on uh, weeds. Mm -hmm. And so there's an extensive city code on weeds and it names every plant that's on this monarch list mm -hmm. as being a weed that you can complain about if your neighbors have it and the, they'll send an inspector who will tell them you gotta mow or, or spray. And so we're working to try to change this and let me and make it clearer in the ordinance that the same ordinance as is currently written, it's, it's not as clearly written as spray or mow, but it does have a method to register your yard as a habitat yard. So if you had a monarch garden and it they had common milkweed, which can grow five feet tall. If you have that registered, then the city inspector can't say anything to you about the fact that you have uh, common milkweed and other so-called weeds growing in your yard. So everyone uh, needs to look at the city ordinance. You can find it, City of Lawrence, and then just Google weed, weed ordinance and uh, Get your yard registered. Terry, if I'm recalling correctly, um, I believe that, uh, again, there's a difference between general weeds and noxious weeds. And I believe Douglas County has a noxious weeds list. And they have, for example, Lespedesia, which is a problem they, you know, they deal with um, out in the country. Um, and one of my points was how come bamboo isn't on the noxious weed list? Because there are unfortunate neighbors um, who plant the traveling kind of bamboo, uh, which is rather invasive. So I think we need to do, and, and thank you for serving on that, that city committee, because we do need to educate more people about the good native plants, um, and again, how important they are for the pollinators. Well, Janae, it's very interesting. Yes, there is a county ordinance on weeds, and the county the state of Kansas has an, a list of noxious weeds, and it has historically been seven weeds, but they did rewrite that ordinance and they've made it to be 10 or 11, including Le Lespedesia, which is an invasive, which was brought in and mm -hmm. spreads. Okay, yeah, so the old noxious weeds were weeds that were hard to clean out a seed and bindweed has been on the list since 1942 <laughs> and because it's hard to eradicate and sure. Johnson grass for example but really having to do with agricultural and commercial mm -hmm. uh, problems okay right. so the the city ordinance is much it has all the noxious weeds listed and a hundred other weeds that says okay this is a problem. And so we're, we've been allowed, I don't know if the city commission is going to adopt it, but we're going to go in line with the county and the state. There are outlaw weeds, there are noxious weeds, because we can't preempt the state. They get to say what the noxious weeds are. And um, so people have got to control those weeds. But for example, poison ivy is not on any kind of list. So uh, there isn't a, any kind of problem with growing poison ivy. And it's, it's all very interesting. Uh, the, the main, my main point was if you're growing garden beds that have tall natives, mm -hmm. over 18 inches, that's the city ordinance. Make sure you contact the city and get your yard registered as a native habitat. Mm. And that includes monarch butterflies. And that's a good thing. 
And then in time, if you're registered, you could even file a complaint against your neighbor for uh, calling turf masters and spraying, you know, mm -hmm. make a complaint about your turf grass neighbor spraying and killing your native habitat. I I'm not recommending that you do that, but I'm just saying it would be possible. <laughs> Yeah. I, I think it's a, it's a great point that, that we need to uh, make sure that, that the historical barriers that are that are more turf grass focused uh, don't get in the way of us doing what's right for the, the population and the environment. And but good point, uh, Terry, register with the city and take the time and the money. I think it's forty dollars to register yourself as a, as a Monarch Way station. That forty dollars goes to support Monarch Watch and all the research that they're doing and and the milkweed that they give away to help support as well as the educational activities. So um, a, a important point that she brings up that we all need to act on. Uh, I've got the sign, but I haven't registered with the city, so I'm going to have to do that. Uh, any more questions, John? I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, I was just thinking, uh, you know, about Terry's point. Um, you know, I think there are more as we, well, we've been um, sponsoring uh, native plant sales, for example, for some time now. And, uh, and, and as you know, Kevin, um, and other folks know, um, we often sell out of native plants because there is a great uh, demand for planting more native plants. And I think more people are getting educated on which natives for which pollinators and for which host butterflies and so forth. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. You know, and I'm hoping that there's more people that maybe will take out more turf either in the backyard or the front yard. And, you know, if they have, again, lots of sunny areas and, and convert it to um, uh, native uh, pollinator plants. Um, but I'm also curious, I haven't, to my knowledge, and Terry, maybe you know, um, has anyone been, quote, cited for having like a front yard of natives? Yes. I mean, how common is that, I guess, is what it, I mean. It's common. It's not uncommon. But okay. there, I don't know, the citation, what the city will send you a notice saying you got to mow your yard, you got to get these under 18 inches, whatever they are. And if they want to specify and say, okay, you've got this, 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 this. I'm not sure they take the time to do that. And then if you don't do it, they will come back and mow it and send you the bill for the mowing. So that is a fine in the sense of the word. Otherwise, I don't believe there are fines. Okay. Uh, but there is cost involved. And your very good point about front yard, backyard, people can't see your backyard and backyards probably look like every which way the people behind you can see your backyard and they have a right to make a complaint too it it is um it, it is uh, it's complaint driven the city inspectors don't really have the time and the manpower to drive around and find every right. tall yard in town Mm -hmm. So they they go in response to complaints. Well, I'm just, again, I'm brainstorming here, talking out loud. I'm just wondering if it's something master gardeners could do is to um, maybe educate the public that native gardens are okay um, and try and convince the city that, you know, I'm not talking tall grass alone, right? I'm talking yeah. about people who have purposefully have uh, native plants have leotris and sunflowers and phlox and you know uh, black-eyed susans and on and on and on um, you know that they are 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 in, in milkweed um, who are purposely trying to uh, plant natives uh, for the monarchs and yeah. other people. I, I, in my experience I think that the challenge is more the the people who have aspirations that are not executed well. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, they start off with with a few <laughs> black-eyed Susans and, and echinacea and now just have 24-inch ragweed and um, and uh, crabgrass and a bunch of other things. And, and that's that's a more difficult, and that's the more likely one people are gonna call on. I know as we were driving to Guthrie's uh, place on the tour, uh -huh. one of her neighbors, you could clearly see had aspirations that, that didn't uh, didn't get fulfilled, and that's one that I don't know that I wouldn't have an issue with talking to them about, because uh, it it kind of diminishes the rest of us who are trying to do it appropriately. Yeah. 
Yeah. When when what? people let it get out of control. And right. Kevin, I wanted to go back to your um, lasagna method of creating beds, you know, with the um, uh, cardboard and compost mulch, et cetera, grass clippings. Um, I might add that uh, it works fine unless you have Bermuda grass. Yep. So I have to constantly, I mean, I've, I've put barriers along the bed, but the Bermuda grass will climb over and under and I'm constantly having to pull out the the, uh, and, and keep the Bermuda grass in control. So yes. that's a project. Now, Bermuda, Bermuda is another beast altogether. And what I typically do in trying to eliminate Bermuda is I will take it to the dirt. I'll let it grow a bit, spray it with Roundup, because I don't have a problem with Roundup if it's used appropriately. And then anything that's left, I will take it to the dirt again, because because that's about all you can do with Bermuda. It's just too aggressive a weed. Right. Um, and um, like I said, I, Roundup is not a bad product per se. It's a bad, it's a beast that got out of hand. Yeah. And to, to have the millions and millions of gallons go on every year is, is not a good use of a, of a good product. Yeah. Well, my problem is I have, I'm surrounded by Bermuda grass on all sides of my neighbors. So even if, even if I did, you know, go the Roundup method, um, it wouldn't, yeah. uh, I, I'd no, be it'll be back. <laughs> it'll be back. It's it'll be yeah. back. It's, it's underneath the driveway. It's you know nothing stops. I found out fire does not kill it either. Yeah, it's yeah. It's uh, people will, would. There used to be a, a common way of dealing with the thatch of zoysia was to just burn it off. Yeah, good and word. and they would often kill the zoysia. <laughs> the Bermuda would then still be there. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Any other uh, comments or questions for Kevin? This has been really uh, uh, fascinating and, and packed with uh, incredible, useful information. It's very, very helpful, Kevin. All right. Well, thank you all for listening, and, and I appreciate your uh, your questions as well. Hopefully, I've inspired you to, to convert some of your yard to a, a way station and to uh, support the activities of Dr. Taylor and his team at Monarch Watch. And as I said, if you've not visited the Monarch Way Station number one. It is a, a spectacular place that uh, we're very proud of as the Douglas County Master Gardeners. And uh, we would be willing and able to help you create one like it in your own space. So thank you for coming today and uh, look forward to our next program. John, what's that going to be? Uh, gosh, it's gonna be about hostas by yours truly. <laughs> I got smitten in the mitten at the American Hosta Society. So um, yes, I'll be uh, sharing uh, how you can deal with a shade garden uh, and use uh, hostas uh, as a low maintenance plant. So. Well, <coughs> Jean, you only have one hour. <laughs> yeah, I know, well, I mean, but, but, uh, but I, it's down to an hour, so at uh, 45 minutes, so, so it'll be fine. So I wanna thank Kevin, thank our participants, uh, uh, and thank you for your comments and questions, and we'll hope to see you at the next public speaker presentation. Thanks All so right. much, everybody. Bye -bye everybody, now. take care, have a great weekend. You too, enjoy. All right. So Kevin, you and I, thank you so much, Kevin. Just a little follow up on, on great job, wonderful slides, uh, nice and tight. Darlene, did you have a comment? No, I just was going to say, I thought it, I, I got in a little bit late, so I'm going to have to watch the first part, but what I what, did watch was amazing. I mean, I even work in the Monarch uh, Garden, and I'm still learned a lot, so. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, well, I tried to focus on stuff that wasn't necessarily so plant-oriented, and, and it's, yeah. it's so important that we, when we consider any of the interventions that we take as humans, what the bigger consequences are and, and they clearly didn't do that with Roundup. Yeah. And and it's it's so unfortunate. And 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 unfortunately the Roundup because of the the Roundup ready crops which have such a negative environmental impact, it's kind of shed a uh, cast a shadow over all GMO. Because GMO is not a bad thing. You know, if if you had a uh, you know and they've been trying for decades now to come up with a rice that had vitamin A. Mm -hmm. now, you don't have vitamin A, you lose your sight. Mm -hmm. And and so much of the population is is uh, rice is their staple. Mm -hmm. And they won't even consider 
you know, a rice that's been, you know, genetically modified to have vitamin A. And it's a shame that you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. Because there's a lot of bathwater in GMO yeah, Roundup is. ready. There is. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Uh, glad you could join us, Darlene. Yep. And uh, see you next time, Kevin. Take care. Yep. Take Bye -bye, care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.